On behalf of Expero International, I would like to welcome you to an Expero Best Practice Board Knowledge Series webinar. The title of this webinar is, What is XBRL? And my name is Christine Brands. We're going to cover multiple things during this webinar, including what is XBRL and its objectives and benefits. We're going to take a look at the main XBRL building blocks. And then we're going to ask and answer the question, what does XBRL look like? And then ask the question and answer, what does extensible mean and why is it needed? We're going to take a look at global XBRL adoption examples. And then finally, we're going to talk about additional training opportunities available to you through XBRL International. First, let's define XBRL. What is it and what are the objectives and benefits? Well, let's start with the acronym XBRL, which stands for Extensible Business Reporting language. And this is represented by an XML language, which is a means of modeling business information that is in a form that the computer can understand and can be used by computer applications. So why should you use XBRL? Well, it all comes down to the new math in business information reporting. And that new math is that transparency equals accuracy plus accessibility plus reusability, which are attributes that are really attractive to business information users. And in addition to the new math, there's a huge benefit to XBRL because what it really does is it helps you streamline your business processes. Let's now take a look at the business reporting supply chain. This raises an important point because XBRL is not just about financial information reporting. This can address reporting needs throughout the entire business reporting supply chain. Let's take a look at two elements of the supply chain. First, processes, and then second, participants. So the source of information for processes comes from business operations, and then that is used to feed internal business reporting and then external business reporting. And then, of course, there are requirements for investment, lending, and then also regulatory compliance. And then at a very, very high level, this information can be used for economic policy making. Next, let's turn to the participants. And the participants may have overlapping needs for information that is prepared through the process element. And those participants can include companies, investors, internal and external auditors, regulators and administrators, software vendors, and service providers. So if you're using XBRL in your organization, that means that you won't have to create one-off reports every single accounting period or month or on demand for these participants. If you have an XBRL system in place, you will be able to have automatic applications that will be able to serve these reporting needs. So that goes back to an earlier point that I was talking about, which is the value of XBRL to streamline business processes. Let's now turn to the building blocks of XBRL. And this discussion is just going to introduce you to some of these concepts. And during the second webinar in this series, we're going to take a look at this in a little bit more detail, but the purpose of this is to give you a little background. We're going to discuss the importance of the instance document, which is on the right. We're going to take a look at the taxonomy and how that plays a role in the XBRL system. 
link bases, and then finally the taxonomy extension. First, let's look at the instance document. And what you're looking at is the Carnival Corporation's Consolidated Balance Sheet. And this is the standard format that you're accustomed to when you look at your paper financial statements. Now, the actual source of this information is an XML file using XBRL tags. So each one of those balance sheet accounts and the amounts has a corresponding XBRL tag which is represented in that XML file. And the XML file then can be used to render this balance sheet in this form. Next, let's look at the importance of taxonomy. So you may be wondering, where do those XBRL tags come from? Well, they come from something called a taxonomy, which is like a dictionary. And it has a list of XBRL elements that are used for tagging your XBRL applications. So let's look at an example. The IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, has its own XBRL taxonomy, which contains financial statements for that accounting standard. So an example, a name of an account, for example, IFRS account would be other reserves, and its corresponding IFRS XBRL tag would be other reserves, with no space between the two. Let's now turn to link bases. And these are also known as layers. And this is a way to enhance the information of a financial statement element or an element in the taxonomy that you're using. So for example, looking back at the IFRS example, we looked at other reserves. And there could be a link base to the IFRS standards describing how that should be treated for IFRS reporting. And other examples of link bases would be how we would present other reserves on the financial statements. And another example would be what calculations are used to report that information. So what does XBRL look like? Well, I want you to think barcode. So if we have the phrase, don't worry, be happy, the barcode but directly beneath it is the way to tag that phrase to the barcode. And that's a concept that we want to think about when we're looking at XBRL tagging. Let's take a look at another example. And so let's say we have a business information user who has an employee badge with a barcode on it. And the barcode contains the tag with the meanings of name of the person, company name, employee ID number, maybe the security level, job title, location, and hobbies. Here's another example of a financial statement, but this time what we're going to do is add the XBRL tag that would represent the financial account name. So in this case, we're looking at revenues, and we have the XBRL tag on the, in the third column, which is UF's GAAP Revenues Abstract. And then the second line, sales, has an amount in US dollars, almost $29 million. And then there's that XBRL tag that's used to relate the XBRL to the financial statement, name, and amount. Another important concept in XBRL is the concept of extensible. So just exactly what does that mean? Well, extensible represents flexibility in XBRL. So just a few minutes ago, we talked about taxonomies and how they're a dictionary of the elements, such as in a US GAAP taxonomy. And the extension allows the XBRL users to add tags, to customize tags, if for some reason 
the tag that they need to correctly present their information isn't included in the taxonomy. It's also known as an extension element. And here's a good example. This is United Airlines. In 2009, they needed to add an extension to cover fuel costs because it wasn't listed in the taxonomy. And as you know, fuel cost is a very important element of cost of goods sold for the airline industry. Let's now take a look at the adoption for regulatory purposes globally of XBRL. So we have three categories. The olive green represents countries that are developing regulatory applications. In the purple, we see countries that are voluntarily filing to one or more regulators using XBRL. And then finally, the green examples represent countries that are filing to one or more regulators. So here are some specific global XBRL adoption examples. In Australia, there's voluntary reporting for standardized business reporting, and that means that the Australian Department of the Treasury coordinated with a number of agencies to identify the information that those agencies needed. So a filer in Australia just simply enters the information once, and then the reports are automatically populated for the agencies who are cooperating under this voluntary program. The UAE recently adopted XBRL for the UAE stock exchanges, and that becomes effective in 2013. And interestingly, they're using an Arabic taxonomy for that implementation. Since April of 2011 in the UK, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs has required that all organizations, listed companies, private companies, nonprofits, and charities file their tax information using XBRL. And then finally, in the US, the SEC has the XBRL reporting mandate of 2009, which requires all publicly traded companies in the United States to file their regulatory financial statements, such as the 10K and the 10Q, using XBRL. Let's now turn to additional training opportunities. As I mentioned earlier, the XBRL Best Practices Board Knowledge Series has three additional webinars with plans to add more. So we encourage you to attend these to help you build your XBRL knowledge. Additional training opportunities include the recently issued XBRL Foundation Certificate Program. And this is a great opportunity for you to receive training take an exam and receive a well-recognized certification in XBRL. And by completing this and holding this certification, this will help you meet XBRL expectations and objectives within your organizations. So if you'd like further information about that, please go to www.xbrlcertification.com. And finally, XBRL International has a very active international conference training program. So here are some examples of that, and I encourage you also to attend that. Well, thank you for your participation in this webinar. And as I mentioned, we have additional webinars in this series, so I encourage you to attend those to build your XBRL knowledge. Thank you.